<laughs> in multiple <laughs> simplicity. <clears throat> Until I was 30, I couldn't pronounce it either. Okay. <laughs> Consolmagno, I'm told, is the Italian pronunciation. Okay. Yeah. Um, like Dr. Betzig, I'm also from Michigan, uh, eight years older. I also grew up in the Detroit area. And I went to the Jesuit high school. Now, everybody of my generation who was male was going to be a scientist. That was because of the space race. And sadly, girls weren't going to be scientists, just boys in those days. Terrible, terrible thing. Um, <clears throat> so I had this interest in astronomy and the, uh, the chemistry set in the basement and all these sorts of things. And <clears throat> like the, Dr. Chu, I had a family that was very well educated. Both my parents, <clears throat> college educated. My grandfather, who had come from Italy as a child, had gone to Boston University and become a lawyer. My dad was a journalist. <clears throat> I was torn between science, journalism. <clears throat> when I went to the Jesuit high school in Detroit, they told me all the smart kids did Latin and Greek, and I wanted to be a smart kid. <clears throat> so I left science behind. I did the classics major, <clears throat> and then went off to Boston College to be a history major. But at the same time, my best friend from high school was a freshman at MIT. And when I'd visit him on the weekend, I found that MIT had tunnels you could explore and pinball machines and weekend movies, and most importantly, the world's largest collection of science fiction. In order to read science fiction, <clears throat> I figured out a way to transfer to MIT. <clears throat> but I had to declare a major. And I knew I was not going to be an engineer because the only thing I can make with a hammer is noise. <clears throat> and I knew I wasn't going to be a physics major because I had a classics background, I was a historian. <clears throat> But I found in the list of majors, Earth and planetary science. And I thought, planets. People have adventures on planets. So I checked that off. They let me in. <clears throat> to this day, I don't know why. After I arrived, I discovered that I had signed up for the geology department. And I could not imagine anything more boring than looking at rocks. You know, what are you going to do? There's a rock, you know, and there's another rock. What, what's, what's to study? <clears throat> but there was a professor there, a fellow named John Lewis, who had been a student of Harold Urey's, who had been a student of G.N. Lewis, so he was <clears throat> well-connected, and he taught a class about meteorites. And meteorites are rocks, but they have fallen from outer space. They are pieces of space that you can hold in your hands. And he was a tremendously dynamic teacher. <clears throat> I got so excited that I would wake up every Tuesday and Thursday and jump out of bed eager to get to class to hear more about meteorites. Um, I <clears throat> stayed on, actually did a completely th theoretical based thesis on ice and rock together and what happens if you have a moon made of ice and rock and is there gonna be enough rock, uh, ma uh, radioactive materials in the rock to melt the ice? And in the process, at the end of my master's thesis, I had predicted in 1975 everything that Voyager discovered when it got to the icy moons of Jupiter in 1979. And all the bases of where my calculations came from were totally wrong. <clears throat> I had underestimated the heat input by a factor of 10 and underestimated the heat output by a factor of 10, but I came up with the right number <clears throat> and at least gave them an idea of what to look for. I also, in the thesis, ended by saying, I will not go as far as to predict life in these oceans under the ice crusts of Europa. I will leave that for others more experienced in such speculations, making fun of Carl Sagan. So this is, as far as I know, the first time in the literature that anyone mentioned life in an icy moon of Jupiter. Except I'm not the first person to predict it. I'm the first person to go out of my way not to predict it. I was enjoying this so much that I was encouraged to join a brand new department at the University of Arizona in planetary sciences. I went there in 1975, um, <clears throat> worked with a few different professors, and eventually got a degree with a fellow named Randy Jocopy, who works in cosmic rays, <clears throat> on the, the electromagnetism in the early solar nebula, and what are its effects, hardly any that we could find, but you know, it took a thesis to work that out. My real goal was to go back to Boston. 
I loved being in Boston. I loved being at MIT. So I was two years a postdoc at Harvard and then three more years a postdoc at MIT, at which point I realized five years as a postdoc means you're not going to get a job. <clears throat> and I was turning 30. And that Jesuit training came back to haunt me. Why am I doing astronomy when people are starving in the world? And I couldn't answer it. I'm busy trying to write theoretical papers that five people in the world will read, and two of them are an my enemies. Why am I doing this? So I quit science. And I joined the US Peace Corps, and I said, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Do anything you want me to do. Let me be useful. They sent me to Kenya. And within three, year, three months, I was at the best high school in Nairobi, the Starehe Boys Center, that had laser labs and computer labs in 1982. <clears throat> and I was there for one term, and then they sent me to the university, where I was teaching graduate students astrophysics. And I thought, well, people are starving. The kids I was teaching all had jobs waiting at the Kenya Science Teachers College to teach the teachers, to teach them to help the development. And that was the logic, but that wasn't why they wanted to know astronomy. Because every weekend I'd go up country with a little telescope and I'd set it up and everybody in the village would come and look through the telescope and they'd, they'd see the rings of Saturn and they'd go, wow. And of course, everybody back in Michigan, when they see the rings of Saturn, they go, wow. And has anybody here ever seen the rings of Saturn in a small telescope and not gone, wow? Because this is what human beings do. Because this is what separates us from well-fed cows. Because this is the meaning of we do not live by bread alone. You also have to feed your soul. And that's why you do astronomy, when people are starving in the world. Because they're starving for more than just something to fill their stomach. Thrilled by this, I went back to America, got a teaching job at Lafayette College, a wonderful little school. Um, <clears throat> broke up with the girl I was dating, which was the happiest day in both of our lives, because we were really not right for each other. Wonderful person, but, but it wouldn't have worked. And at that point, with my MIT, two MIT degrees, <clears throat> did a mathematical calculation. If I met the perfect woman tomorrow, by the time we had a family, I'd be 40. By the time those kids were teenagers, I'd be 65. Way too old. What's plan B? Well, <clears throat> I had this Jesuit background. If I joined the Jesuits, I could teach at a Jesuit school, and then I'd never have to worry about tenure. Not true, <clears throat> but I didn't know that. So I joined the Jesuits, and I discovered that plan B was really plan A. For the first time in my life, I was content. I knew where I belonged. And when I was telling somebody the story about turning 40 and family, they said, Guy, 40 plus 15 is 55, not 65. <coughs> so the reason I became a Jesuit is that I don't know how to add. <clears throat> Also, they didn't let me teach at a Jesuit college like I expected. Under obedience, <clears throat> they forced me, they ordered me without asking to go to Rome, eat that terrible food that we've been having, look at that horrible scenery, and oh yes, live in the Pope's summer palace. And my instructions upon arriving at the Vatican Observatory were do good science. Incidentally, <laughs> we happened to have a collection of a thousand meteorites. Remember meteorites? Remember how excited I was with meteorites? What do you do with a collector's collection of a thousand meteorites? We didn't have the equipment to break them up, but I knew from my theoretical work that no one had actually ever measured their physical properties, the density, the porosity, the magnetic properties, the thermal properties. And so, <clears throat> knowing that it might take 20 years to do it, but also knowing that I wasn't under the pressures of a three-year grant cycle or tenure, I had 20 years. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, and then the last five years turned it over to Bob Mackey, who's a younger Jesuit brother who does the same thing as I do, only better. And the collection, any data you see in the literature now about the physical properties of space materials probably comes out of our lab. Three years ago, <clears throat> Pope Francis assigned me to be the director of the Vatican Observatory. It's a five-year term, renewable until I get sick of it. And so I'm in year three of it, but I'm, I'm enjoying myself too much. So I expect to be in for a while. It has been my joy to continue <clears throat> to do 
what, and to tell the new people what I had been told, your job is to do good science and you have as much time and as many resources as you need. And the science I do, <clears throat> physical data collection, may not get me the Nobel Prize, but it's data that will still be true 100 years from now, which is probably more than you theorists can do. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> forward to your contributions to our academy. Uh, it is important for us that the Vatican has an observatory and uh, therefore uh, we uh, count on your advice in all these fields and it's nice to know that you have a, a broad background. It's a privilege to be part of this group and so long as I'm the director I'm, I know that I'll be welcome here. This is wonderful.